Welcome to the Broken Vessels Podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I'd like to thank you for joining me again for the Broken Vessels podcast. This is episode 11, and this is uh, part two of our series talking about spiritual abuse, being broken by spiritual abuse with our very special guest, Jeff White. Uh, Jeff, thanks again for coming on to the Broken Vessels podcast. Uh, We really appreciate uh, what you had to share with us on our last episode about what the definition of spiritual abuse is. Oh, thanks a lot for having me. I'm really enjoying it. Okay, great. Well, brother, um, so we kind of, in our last episode, we really defined spiritual abuse and even kind of talked about some of the solutions to it. But um, I want to kind of go into a little bit more of a deep dive into the subject. I'd like to ask you, why do you think spiritual abuse is perpetuated in the church. What do you think is at the core of why this is such really an epidemic in the church? Well, that's a great question and one that really deserves a lot of cogitation, a lot of thinking about it, because I think it's, I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's multiple reasons. Before I jump into that right there, let me say, you know, when we talk about spiritual abuse, because, you know, we defined that on the last episode, But I think it's important to say spiritual abuse, what it's not, you know, that's part of the way of understanding it. We're not talking about unbelievers being mad because a pastor preached the gospel. Right. Okay. Because whatever the gospels, if you read the book of Acts, it's very clear that when the gospel, the true gospel is proclaimed, there will always be two groups of people, people that receive it and people that reject it. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking just about somebody, somebody being mad because the truth of the Bible was taught in a loving, humble, gracious way. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about people getting mad at church because the pastor didn't do what they wanted him to do or didn't say what they wanted him to say or because the color of the carpet in the business meeting became blue instead of red. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about piddly little, you know, little offenses that happen here and there in churches. People are human. They're sinful. They're fallen. Everybody has their preferences. We're, We're not talking about something minor like that. We're talking about where the Bible, authority, discipline, position, things like that have been misused, Mm -hmm. okay? And it's caused a deep moral injury to someone's soul, Mm -hmm. okay? Where that they're traumatized. You know, I've seen and counseled with people so traumatized that they can't even go to church without being triggered because they it's left such an imprint on them. Uh, they can't read the Bible because they get triggered by the way someone has tried to lord their authority over a person's conscience. Uh, we are not allowed as pastors and ministers of the gospel to, to control and bind a person's conscience. Only God has the right to do that. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, we lovingly tell people the truth, but it's up to the Spirit to impart the truth to people in their hearts and in their conscience. It's not our job to try to make people have the same conscience we have, especially about secondary and tertiary doctrinal issues or extra biblical issues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we need to know what spiritual abuse is not. Now, you ask, you know, why is it so prevalent in the church? I think, first of all, there's not a lot of teaching about it to make people aware of it. I think, second of all, that there, uh, and I guess you could call that ignorance. There's just ignorance. And I don't mean that in a bad way, like say someone's dumb. I mean, ignorant, like in lacking information. They don't understand what it is. Like we said before, there's some people sitting there and they've been spiritually abused and they know something's wrong in the church, but they don't know what to call it. Right. And so I think it also that ignorance works the other way in terms of leadership. There are leaders who simply do not understand what the Bible teaches about it. And they have a faulty understanding about the nature and the scope of their authority as a pastor. 
Mm-hmm. They don't correctly understand leadership. Leadership is not about you going out as a pastor and controlling and micromanaging and coercing your congregation to do what you want or to do what, even if you believe that's what God wants. It's leadership is service. Mm. Leadership is loving people. It's being gentle with people. It's serving the people. It's influence. It's using the scriptures and prayer to influence people right. and to lovingly model humility and gentleness. Uh, so I think there, I think there's a lot, there's ignorance. I think also there is just incompetence. Mm-hmm. I think that there are some people who are, for lack of a better way to describe it, are guilty of, of clergy malpractice. Now I know that I'm not talking about it in a legal sense, because I know there have been cases in America that had to do with clergy malpractice. That's not really what I'm saying. I'm just saying that any profession, I don't care if you're talking law enforcement, doctors, lawyers, anybody, dentists, chiropractors, you know, anybody, any profession can have people that are incompetent and don't know what they're doing. And there's a malpractice there. And so there's just some people who have unsound judgment and that's one of the qualifications of a pastor is to have sound judgment. Yeah, yeah, I and agree a lot of people you. don't. Yeah, they don't make wise decisions on how they deal with people. Would you say too, like maybe another aspect of maybe along with the incompetence, there's just like apathy or a laziness toward the profession to a degree. Oh, yeah, there could be. Yeah, absolutely. There could be. And sometimes it's easier to try to force people than to love people. Right. Or if somebody's people's difficult. (laughs) Yeah. Or if somebody's going through something um, rather than dealing with it in a proper biblical way, like you said, with grace and the gospel and really uh, weeping with those who weep, you know, walking through it with them, bearing their burden along with them. It's just easier just to be to fall into that spiritual abuse kind of way of just basically saying this is the law. You better get with the program or else because it's just easier than than actually walking through the situation with the person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. I think that indifference and I'm going to be honest with you, there are times when spiritual abuse happens because. A pastor has resentment at a church member. We don't like to admit that, but that's true. Oh, yeah. There are certain people in churches that we view as problem people, and we just want them out of our church. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, it's not our church. It's God's church. And so I think that uh, we need that you have to have a right perspective of these are God's sheep. God's sheep are fallen, weak, imperfect people, and they act that way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's part of, of ministry. It's the messy part of ministry. It's not easy. It's not, I think uh, it's sad that sometimes I get the feeling that some pastors, what they really want is they just want a church full of people that's going to come, love listening to the Bible, have good stable jobs so they can give lots of money to the church and not have any problems in their life and just be very semi-perfect. And that is not reality. Yeah. I think that's the people that are uh, looking for the perfect church that doesn't exist. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That is just not reality. No. And if you have a very, and again, I'm going to say this, fundamentalism by its very nature is very moralistic, perfectionistic, idealistic, uh, legalistic. You can, and the problem with fundamentalism isn't the fact that they believe the fundamentals or the essentials of orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. The problem is they don't stop there. Right. Fundamentalism wants to go on, and because it uh, it views the Bible in such a strict way, which it is God's word, we are to obey God's word, but Mm -hmm. they take secondary doctrinal matters for a church and tertiary matters of conscience for an individual, and they view those with the same passion and zeal and tenacity that they do primaries or essentials of orthodoxy, and then they try to enforce it on the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, you know, God in his infinite wisdom and in his perfect omniscience could have made every single doctrine in the Bible a test of salvation and our fellowship, but he did not. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason God did this is because God knows we're all in different places spiritually in our lives. Mm-hmm. We're not all the second we get saved theologians with perfect theology. Right. <laughs> and, uh, that, and, you know, I know in my life, I was genuinely converted at 20 years old sitting at work thinking about a verse of scripture and was converted sitting at work. And I wasn't praying when I got converted. I know that'll mess with some people's theology. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about Romans six twenty three. you know, the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God's eternal life. And I was sitting there talking to myself. I wasn't talking to God. I was, I was thinking, now, do I receive that or do I reject that? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the light came on and I knew I received that and I had assurance of my salvation. So, uh, and then was convicted I needed to be baptized after that. I was probably more Calvinistic by the time I was 24, just because I was listening to good Bible teachers and stuff. But I was 35 and pastoring a church, or 34 and pastoring a church before I embraced total depression. I mean, before I embraced limited atonement. The problem wasn't that I didn't understand it from Scripture. The problem was... I I just didn't have all of those universal passages reasoned out in my mind. Mm-hmm. Now, I hope now I hope people there I, some people would say, "Oh, well then you weren't really saved till you believe that." Well, no, I was really saved when I was 20 years old, but the, as I have grown spiritually in my walk with the Lord, even these last 5 years as I've come to understand spiritual abuse and things like that, your theology should always be developing and growing and maturing. Uh, you're always reforming, okay? And so uh, you should always be moving in, in a greater understanding of, of illumination of Scripture. I'm glad that God doesn't make every single doctrine in the Bible a test of salvation or fellowship, because if he did, none of us would be saved. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, okay? There is a body, though, however, of essentials that are indicated in scripture to be essential. For example, in John, whenever Jesus says, unless you believe I am he, you will die in your sin. Mm -hmm. That is a fundamental, right? That is an essential. He say he's indicating that there. He's saying, you don't believe this. You're not in. Okay. But now you take the roles of husbands and wives in marriage. Okay. He doesn't say, unless you're complementarian or unless you're egalitarian, you're not in. He doesn't indicate that. There is room for us to agree to disagree without being disagreeable over that issue. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean the issue isn't important. Right. Lots of issues in the Bible are important. In fact, all of God's word is important, but not all of it is a test of orthodoxy. Right. And what you find in spiritually abusive circles, especially ones that are more ultra-conservative and hyper-literal in their interpretation of the Bible, they like to use those secondary and tertiary issues to abuse people with. And if you don't agree with them about those things, then you're viewed as being unbiblical. And because you're unbiblical, you're unspiritual. And because you're unspiritual, you're ungodly. And Fourth, you might be unsafe because you don't agree with me. I always think about this, and I may have shared this with you before. I don't remember, but I always think about the the reformers who were Pado Baptists. I always think about the reformers who actually drowned to death Anabaptists because they didn't agree with them about baptism. Now, you talk about spiritual abuse. That's spiritual abuse. Yeah. As important as I believe baptism is, and it is important, it's not a test of salvation or fellowship. And but we, we they made it that, and so if they didn't agree with them about baptism, then they considered them heretics. So they ought to die, and they killed them. That's spiritual abuse. As much as I love the reformers, for them to have done that to the Anabaptists, so uh, you know spiritual abuse goes long way back. It's not something new. There are people that have misused scripture and authority and discipline for a long time. Okay, so you know we've really kind of fleshed out some of the reasons. I certainly not in a comprehensive way, but many, many no, I think no. are the primary reasons why uh, spiritual abuse is perpetuated. Really, I think at the core of why it's perpetuated is because we're all sinners. <laughs> I think that's really. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's at right. the core You're of it. Correct. I mean, that, that there, we all are selfish at our core. We all want what we want, what we want, and not only that, but we we I think many times we operate in fear. We operate in fear, and what tends to happen when you operate in fear is uh, it, it, fear and selfishness. Um, yep. I think many times what you do is you want to control not only your own circumstances, but you want to control the world around you. 
And so then you fall into this trap of becoming manipulative, as you uh, stated, you know, uh, doing things um, to try to move pieces on the on the board, so to speak, to try to make everything work out the way you want. And when we do that, it inevitably is going to bring brokenness into other people's lives. And really, I think even spiritual abusers don't realize they're they're causing themselves brokenness by doing that because eventually it is going to catch up with them. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And eventually they're going to give an account to God. Yes. You know, I always think about that. You know, it's just like I, I think to myself, what happens if someday when you die and you stand before the Lord, you find out that that person you disagreed with over a secondary or tertiary matter, they were the one that was right and you were wrong. And you disciplined them over that. You punished them over that. You rejected them over that, shunned them over that. Think about how that's going to play out. Yeah. I think we would be a lot better off having humility and realizing that there is a difference between unanimity and unity. Mm-hmm. Unanimity is uh, is where everybody has to agree. Right. Okay. Unity is where we agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Mm-hmm. And uh, spiritual abusers often confuse unanimity with unity. And then when you don't have unanimity with them, they falsely will accuse you of being divisive when you're not really being divisive. Mm -hmm. There are some, some particular doctrines that spiritual abusers like to key in on and use against the congregation, use against their flock. Unit divide, accusing people falsely of division because they just don't agree Mm -hmm. is not, is not biblically. Okay. That's, it's okay to disagree. Right. Okay. Uh, now I wouldn't, now I don't think it's okay for you to sit in the congregation and pick up a rock and throw it at your pastor while he's in the pulpit. I don't think that. No, not at That's all. That's different. Okay. You're being harmful then at that point, but just a, a disagreeing does not make you a divisive person. Spiritual, uh, again, pastoral authority is often misused because they don't understand that a pastor's authority is not unlimited. It is limited to the scope of Scripture and those things that are specifically delineated in Scripture. Mm-hmm. So that's why extra biblical commands are outside of the scope of their authority. And they don't understand that their authority is an authority to control the congregation. It's an authority to teach the congregation. Right. And... um and they they just they miss these things. There's a lot of confusion in their mind, and again, that goes back to the whole thing about ignorance. Right, for sure, for sure. You know, you've talked about how many times what these spiritual abusers will do is they will literally use church discipline as like a rod of of correction, which really it is biblical. To I mean, there is a biblical argument. Let me put it that way for church discipline. And I think there is a such thing as legitimate church discipline. Um, I, 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 agree. I, I yeah. and uh, you know I think Paul talks about that, and uh, G, uh, you know Jesus. Uh, it, I, I, I'm I'm still not completely convinced about like um, the Matthew 18 passage that that you know Jesus is talking about the Christian church right now or whatever you know. But I, I don't know. We we can, we can maybe talk about that a little bit, but. What is the difference between spiritual abuse and actual legitimate church discipline? Like, because here's the thing. Some people are probably thinking to themselves, okay, Jeff, well, um, I'm, I've been under church discipline and now I realize I was being spiritually abused and I'm sure that's the case. Um, but but then I think there's other people that actually did need to be under church discipline and I don't want them to get confused and be like, oh, they, they spiritually abused me when really, no, they were loving you. And so right. Uh, right. C- kind of talk to that. Talk, talk about that. What is the difference? Like, what does legitimate church discipline actually look like in opposition to spiritual abuse? Great, great, great question. And first, let me say that if you have been wrongly spiritually abused, one of the things I always direct counsel East to is John chapter nine. Go back and read that because there is a man who is wrongly excommunicated from the synagogue because the blind man who is blind from birth. And I love that story because Jesus goes and seeks him out. 
And I think that Jesus does that today with people that have been wrongly excommunicated. I think he goes to them and in a special way sustains them. And uh, I think that I don't want people to think that because they were wrongly spiritually, uh, the ones they were wrongly disciplined by a church that was spiritually abusive, I, I, I don't want them to confuse the church with God. And that's something I have to remind people a lot. Those people that represent God don't always do a good job of representing God. So do not assume that their position was God's position necessarily. And you need to understand, you can go through all the motions of church discipline, but if it was done incorrectly for the wrong reasons or for or some reason it should not have been done, that was not a real church discipline in God's eyes. All those people did was go through a religious ritual, and that was it. So you don't have to worry about God coming after you to get you because they wrongly disciplined you. God knows whether it was. It's like Baptists. And, you know, and I'm a credo Baptist. I know there's my brothers out there that are paedo Baptists. You know, God bless them. I'm one in of them, credo brother. Baptist, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In credo Baptist circles, we believe that if you get baptized and you weren't saved, that it was an invalid baptism, okay? Right. So we would look at that and say, you just went through a religious ritual. You just got wet, and there was not a real baptism. Well, the same thing is true here with church discipline. If if you, they've gone through the motions of that, but it should not have been done, God knows that. Mm-hmm. And God is not going to honor that discipline. Right. And I think Jesus comes and finds the people, just like he did that man in John 9. Mm-hmm. So let, that's, a, pre, that's a, a little prelude here to say that. So I think... So restate your question to me, because I want to make sure I get it get right. So what... Oh, I know. Legitimate versus illegitimate. Right. right? So what what does legitimate yeah. church discipline actually look like in opposition to spiritual abuse? I think legitimate church discipline is done, first and foremost, for the right reasons. The motives and the intentions must be right. And I think, second of all, it has to be for legitimate biblical reasons and the problem is spiritual abusers today do not get the reasons right right for example if you look at the cases of church discipline in the new testament there is not one example of church discipline being conducted for a secondary doctrinal matter or a tertiary matter of conscience or for an extra biblical issue mm-hmm. not one all discipline actions in the New Testament, they're either number one for unrepentant violations of moral law, mm-hmm. violations of the Ten Commandments, either in practice or in principle. Okay, the things that are mentioned as being worthy of discipline are all in some way or another in principle violations of the Ten Commandments of the moral law. Number two, unrepentant violations of matters of orthodoxy, like denying the resurrection. Or, number three, unrepentant division, unrepentant division over those two things that I just mentioned, Mm -hmm. over moral law or over heresy, over, you know, lack of orthodoxy. So the problem is, is we take the instructions for church discipline and we apply those. And again, it's fundamentalism at its core. It's radical application. Mm -hmm. We include all secondary tertiary matters. And by the way, it's legalism and legalism always breaks down at some point. I mean, when's the last time you saw someone disciplined for not being joyful at all times or for not giving thanks at all times or for not giving like they should. You just don't see that. But yeah, we'll zero in on a poor woman that's having the snot beat out of her by her abusive husband. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll discipline her if she separates or gets divorced. Mm. We're more worried about that than we are the individual in the marriage. We've made an idol out of the institution of marriage. <laughs> I'm not saying the institution of marriage isn't, isn't important. It absolutely is. It's one of the three institutions that God has set up. I agree that it's important. Mm-hmm. But the individuals in it are more important than the institution because they're made in the image of God. Man, brother, preach. So, <laughs> that is good. So that is why that is important. And, you know, there's at least four or five different interpretations of how to view the marriage, divorce, and remarriage passages in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And again, what if you get to heaven someday and you give an account to God and you find that your view of divorce and remarriage and, and that kind of thing was the wrong view, and the other person was right. 
And here you are. You've been disciplining people over that issue. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Yeah. The spiritual abuser is usually very self-righteous, very prideful. They will not consider that they might be wrong. There's no humility there that says, what if I'm wrong about this? What if my interpretation or how I see this is wrong? Since I'm a fallen person that's imperfect and sin has affected my mind and my thinking, what if I am wrong about this issue? And so uh, you don't find an example in the Bible of disciplining people over marriage, divorce, remarriage in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Not a one. And so, uh, but boy, we like to pick on them. My mom, God rest her soul, she went home to be at the Lord a year ago mm-hmm. after four year, a four-year battle with plasma cancer. Back in the 60s, my mom made a profession of faith. And uh, I was born in 65. I think it was probably, you know, 68 or something like that. And my mom had had gone through a divorce when I was a year old because of, of abuse, but also because my father ran off with another woman. Hmm. And my mom was only 20, 20 years old when I was born, but I think she was 21 when the divorce happened. Now, my mom never remarried. She said, I had enough of men. I'm not ever married to men. She said, I'm done with this deal. And she was a devoted single mother the rest of her life, a great mother. Mm -hmm. But I remember in this church, whenever I was a little boy that we went to, they would find out, this is in the 60s, it was a fundamentalist church. They would find out my mom was divorced, and the first thing they would tell her was, now, you know you can't get married again. Oh, my goodness. You know you can't do that. The lack of grace the lack of love. We come along and we take these secondary and tertiary issues and we want to beat the holy crud out of people with these rules that we come up with that where we think we're right about that. You know, even John MacArthur and John Piper and Bodie Bauckham don't totally agree on divorce and remarriage issues. Right. Okay. And they're, they're viewed as ultra conservative reformed leaders. Okay. Listen, people don't always agree on those issues, and we need to give grace where we can give grace. And I think that, you know, we're going back, circling back to our original question was about, is it legitimate or illegitimate? If they are conducting discipline for wrong reasons, or if they are conducting discipline over wrong issues, then that is an abusive form of church discipline. Yes. And that is spiritual abuse. Discipline them because you want to get them out of your church or because you view them as a problem person or because they don't agree with you 100% about some issue uh, or because they resist you trying to micromanage and control their life in extra biblical ways, those kinds of things. God knows the real motives for why people do what they do. And one day that's going to be exposed at the judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And so God is not going to let the wrongful use of spiritual abuse go by. Yes, that's and true. And unfortunately, in a, in a lot of these un, in a lot of these ultra literalist, ultra conservative churches. And by the way, I'm a theological conservative. I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. If people were to look my name up on the internet, you would find that in the Missouri Baptist Convention. I advocated strongly for a theological study committee, and I fought tooth and nail for the sufficiency of Scripture. I have got a history of that. So I'm not a liberal. I'm not someone who is against obeying the Bible. I'm not an antinomian at all. So, But I am against the wrongful interpretation and or wrongful application of Scripture. And I do think fundamentalism is closely connected to spiritual abuse. And I think that it is often spiritually abusive because it it's so radical and extreme in how it applies the Bible. And so even to the point where we're going to go discipline a woman who's being beat up by her husband, mm. you know, she's got to stay there and suffer for Jesus. Because, see, again, they have an extreme wrong view of suffering. Right. And that's just one of several things that could be discussed. You know, they tend to have extreme views. And so... I think that, you know, um, you need to really look at what the motive is and what the manner was, what the issue was about, because there are some church discipline actions that happen today, and we've got an increasing number of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do, because for, for since the 70s, you've got lots of reformed ministries, and we could name them, you know, Grace to You, Nine Marks, uh, uh, Founders, uh, Gospel Project, the Gospel Coalition, Piper's Ministry, Desiring God, even Ligonier, who I, I loved, R.C. Sproul. 
you know, you've got these ministries that are constantly hammering. We got to do church discipline, got to do church discipline. The problem is they're not also saying at the same time, oh, by the way, if you do church discipline and you handle it wrong, you are disqualified for ministry because right. you have lorded your authority over someone. Mm. Okay. And, and by the way, that's another position with that gets extreme and taken out of is okay. You're disqualified. Now you're permanently forever disqualified. No chance in heck that you're ever going to be not disqualified. That's an extreme application. You know, it ignores the fact that all of the qualifications of a pastor are present tense in the Greek text. They're not talking about a person's past or their future. They're talking about right now in the present. Right. And so uh, hyper-literal conservative applications of scripture are almost always abusive, whether we're talking about discipline or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I want to make a point because, you know, what some of our listeners may be pastors that have done this yep. or, yep. and they realize it and they are repentant of it. And I think like you would even, I, I believe in the last time that we, uh, uh, the first time that we had you on, you talked about like how, just in your own ignorance, like you actually believe, like even from the pulpit, that you were somewhat spiritually abusive, you know? Oh, yeah. And yeah, I was. And so talking about giving an account to God, yeah, there, there will be a time where there will, especially for church leaders, because they, they're given a higher authority and they are told you are going to give an account. But the good mm-hmm, news right. is that the grace that we find and the mercy that we find in the gospel even takes care of that. <laughs> Absolutely. It does. Well, brother, this has been a wonderful conversation, continuing to kind of dive into this subject of spiritual abuse, kind of uh, talking about what the differences are between that and uh, church discipline. Um, I want to have you on um, again to talk about your own personal experiences and maybe maybe uh, some examples and uh, like you've given us already, uh, just to kind of give people an idea of what in real time um, spiritual abuse really looks like. You've given some pretty good examples, but we, we want to kind of flesh that out a little bit. And then I'd also like to talk about some solutions in our next episode. So uh, would you mind uh, coming back for a third episode? Does that sound good? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Well, we want to thank you all for joining us today for the Broken Vessels podcast, and we'll see you next week. 